I'm Mohammed Zachary, a professional calligrapher. In life, you, you, you acquire a number of things, talents and skills and things like that. Maybe you didn't set out to get them, but you get them, you know. They call me teacher, you know. Our rule on this thing in calligraphy is that if you can do it, you must teach. What is Islamic calligraphy? Some people call it Arabic calligraphy. I call it calligraphy of the Arabic script. And, and rather than Islamic, because if you say Islamic, okay, that, there's a good aspect to that, but that's very museumish. And that treats Islam as if it were just some dynasty, you know, like this Islamic dynasty, you know, a thing in the past that has no resonance for the future at all. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, the past plays its part, and we, we're absorbed with it, but frankly, the, uh, the future is what we're really thinking about. And so I think it would be a mistake to uh, call it Islamic calligraphy because of its susceptibility to be misinterpreted. And so that's why I call it calligraphy of the Arabic script. So then let me ask, what is calligraphy? Calligraphy is, is well known. Calligraphy means beautiful writing. Kali is a Greek word for, for beautiful, apparently. Graphos. Writing, beautiful writing is, is all it means. It means to write beautifully. But when you write beautifully, it's, it's, it, 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 it makes the communication that much stronger. Uh, how did you come into calligraphy? Uh, when I was 18 or 19 years old, I lived in California. I was becoming a Muslim at that point. I started looking at, at stuff I would find in the great Santa Monica Public Library. There was a book, The Story of Writing, and it had a... Arabic or Persian or Turkish background and look at it and I used to ponder how in the world are they doing that you know and you find out little bits and snippets you know oh they used reed pens so I knew what a reed was because I was a musician and we used reeds in music class. I made a trip to Morocco again in uh, 1964 and I met people over there who, who gave me some better tips so you know you, you, you pick up stuff along the way and I met the royal calligrapher of Morocco in Morocco, and he showed me some stuff. I was basically learned stuff by by informal means. So let me ask, um, why Islamic calligraphy? If you were going to go back to you know 60 years ago and talk to Muhammad Zakaria of that time, uh, and you were to say you were going to be an Islamic calligrapher, you're going to be a world famous Islamic calligrapher. Uh, what would that young Muhammad Zakaria say? It probably would have laughed because uh, number one, it wouldn't have made any sense because um, it's not a it's not a thing you can do to make much of a living. It's, it's not a much of a living, and there's people you know. I've done most of my work uh, on a shoestring, and and I've done it uh, probably with the goal of, of, of um, introducing it to an American public, both the Muslim and the non-Muslim public. Muslim people particularly don't, don't understand that very well. They come from places where handicraft type things like, or just sign painting or newspaper stuff or, you know, cheap stuff that, that, that has no honor to it. It has no uh, value, you know, and stuff like that. And so, uh, I have to go against that, and I have to go against the, 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 the museum quality descriptions as well, you know, which, which try to limit it to a, a museum definable thing. It's not, it's not like what we really have, you know, and, and, and so we, we don't have in the United States anything like the, um, uh, the social situation where these things are appreciated. I like doing stuff by hand. Looking back at my life, I say I just make things. You have to take care of every detail. Every knife you use has to be sharpened properly. You know, everything has to be working order. The lore of keeping your tools in good condition and choosing the right ones and stuff, there's a whole literature on that. There's a phrase the, the, the person who, who neglects his tools neglects what he's going to do with them. You have to spend a lot of time, you have to keep in good shape. The tools are only instruments that do 
what you need them to do, and if they're not in good shape, they won't work. I see people treating their tools poorly. They never sharpen their tools. They whack them with hammers and damage them. When they have a brush, a paintbrush, and they're painting, they just leave it in the bucket of center and it gets all bent and, and it's ruined. You know, this, is, this is very bad workmanship habits. In, in my life, I've never had to buy a pen. There's always people give them to you, you know. I probably have an emotional connection to a pen. No, we have respect for the pen. When the pen hits the paper, when the rubber hits the road, you know that idea. Certain things I have to judge. How is the ink working? How is the pen flowing? Generally speaking, if I'm writing the first inch, I know whether the rest of the whole page is gonna work. And so then when you write with them, you know, your ink has to be just so, it has to flow right and stuff like that. The paper that you work on has to be just right. So if, if you have the pen, the paper, the ink working right, then you are the only one that's a problem, see? So you have to be right and you have, you have to have, you have to be ready for it. You know, you practice a little bit in the daytime before you start. It's a little like a rehearsal. Don't neglect your tools, whatever they may be, you know. There's all kinds of things that can be tools. Uh, don't neglect them. Keep them sharp. Do whatever you need to do to keep them working. Uh, that means your brains and all the rest of it, you know, because you, you, in a sense, are also a tool. And so you have to take care of that. Don't let them get rusty, you know. What's happening with me is total concentration. You're not just concentrating on the middle, you're concentrating what's happening here and what's happening here and what's happening with the ink and what's the paper doing. Your mind is wrapped around so many items that you don't have any time to, to, to be aware really of your surroundings. You know, I mean, you're not, you're not, you have to be there in a very specific kind of way. You know, you have to be uh, just completely, you know, try to be uh, in control of the thing. There's a saying that they say, that you have to be in control of your pen, but very in a very gentle kind of way so that the pen doesn't rebel against you. You, you, you imagine it being a, a living creature so that it doesn't, you don't over, overdo it or make it uh, damage itself. So you have to be very careful to let the pen have its part of the expression of the work it's done. Otherwise, you know, it's gonna show up in problems, you know. I started blind. And as I moved through it, I learned more and more until I learned these things. And now I have a life with no regrets. Uh, I never did have any regrets, but, but I did go into it without having that kind of a knowledge. I went into it with a superficial knowledge and, and, it, and it changed as I went along. The great Baghdad calligrapher from the 10th, 10th century, something like that, 11th century, Ibn Bawab, and he, uh, he gave a pretty good piece of advice to calligraphers. He, he was a teacher, of course. He said, if you're feeling like you can't do it, just do it anyway. Stick your hand out with your pen and write and say Bismillah and write. And then it'll, it'll come, you know. So that, that's, a, that's a good attitude. That's a practical attitude. And, and we try to, to do that and I teach my students that looking at this piece here and it's very it's bold and it's so you know the colors are breathtaking the calligraphy mm -hmm. is beautiful the gold is beautiful yeah. so you know is a part of you go does a, is there a part of you that goes into each piece do you feel uh, I don't know you know maybe maybe breath you know the pen and any tool that you use becomes an extension of your body in other words we have this thought it, it comes from the old masters who wrote in the great, the great early books. They would say that when we're born, we have a certain amount of breaths in our body, and when our breaths finish off, then we're, we die. They also developed the thought of, of breath as a form of energy. And so when a person writes, he's holding his breath so the writing will not be breathless. And they express it like, when you, when you hold your breath, the breath somehow comes down your arm and it goes into your arm and it goes into your pen and it goes into your ink and onto the paper. 
And so the flow of that pen on the paper was called the breath-like flow. And, and so when they would write, this flow would, would manifest itself on the paper as having breath. I read, I read this tafsir, it's an Ottoman Turkish trans, uh, tafsir that was written in the 30s and 40s. He quotes a piece of, of poetry from a poet named Baki, I think he's 16th century. And, and it says, in, in Turkish it says, or translated, it says the period of time involved in the rotation of the heavens is, is, is a moment a moment of time. He says, but Adam, mankind, is only one breath out of all this. When you give somebody this message, this timeless message, and you put it into calligraphy, and you take the calligraphy and you put marble paper around it, or you put golden designs like that, uh, then you're, in a sense, dressing that quotation up uh, as if it was going to go on the world stage. You know, it's going to like getting a really nice new suit for it. It's like a cook. Uh, so a cook always dresses his food up to make it look really nice. You know, the, the colors are good on it, makes it look delicious, you know. So I, I like to make stuff, either intellectual stuff, writing or, or calligraphy or whatever that's delicious. That you want to metaphorically eat it. I want it to appear delicious so that people will want to take it and, and, and enjoy it, you know. Beautifully writing is, 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 is part of life. There's a lot of subtleties in there, you know, like, how do you really shape this letter? Precision writing, what's taking place here is something that takes place to tolerances of thousands of an inches, like, like Sometimes the, the, just the difference of a thousandth of an inch can make or break a piece. A thousandth of an inch is about one third the thickness of a human hair and you're seeing it and you're guiding your tool so that you can achieve that. If everything is working well as your ink and your pen and the paper and all that was working well, then writing is a very pleasant experience.